Okay, it's recording. So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Today we're going to be talking about Rocket Pool. It's a decentralized um, Ethereum staking protocol. Um, quick question before starting. Have any of you used Rocket Pool or know how it works um, uh, from prior, I don't know, education sessions or maybe an article, or maybe you saw Pankos uh, podcast on YouTube and you became familiarized with the protocol. Has any of you have any experience with it? No. Guess not. Okay. So I prepared the first part of the presentation just an, as a very basic explainer of what is the protocol and what it does, why it's so important for Ethereum. So it's basically- I, I have um, a small, small, small experience, but then actually like, I put like a minor amount of money in this. So I hope that you tell the right things that I'm not <laughs> on the right okay. direction. <laughs> nice. <laughs> a quick question, quick question, Marcus. Did you only stake ETH or ETH, or did you become a, a, like a node operator? No, no, the, 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 the first one, just like okay. ETH for, uh, for ARIF. Okay, we are going to see the both use cases today. So okay. it's a decentralized protocol for staking Ethereum in the ETH 2.0 way. Uh, the target user is everyone from people new to staking to staking service providers. And this includes like big changes, like maybe Coinbase, maybe Gemini, maybe Kraken, you know, centralized exchanges that provide staking as a service. And it also can be seasonal stakers, people who's staking right now on the Bitcoin chain um, on you know, their own, they can use this service as well. So the main idea is, or the main meme of the protocol is this is a decentralized and trustless network of ETH stakers. We work towards the decentralization of Ethereum. And in this case, like the, the, the reason behind it is that Ethereum will change the security mechanism for validating transactions from proof of work to proof of stake. That's a very complex topic, but this is what makes um, a place in the market for something like this protocol, like this specific change. That doesn't tell you anything of why this exists. We know what makes it possible or, or why you know, the idea is out there, but the problem- Sorry to interrupt that... you, Sergio, you, you're getting feedback in your voice mm. and I don't know why. That's weird. Let me check it's my like, mic. It's like your internet is like cracking up or something. Let me check. Maybe it's the echo in my room actually. Oh, I know why. How about now? Oh, that's better. Okay, okay, from Mike. Cool. Thank you, Fims. Okay, so uh, the problem that Rocket Pools is trying to solve is that in order to stake Eve in Ethereum 2.0 and become a validator in the network, you have you need a 32 Eve. That's a lot of money, even with current prices, and it also requires some technical knowledge. Most participants don't have the technical knowledge and also don't have the 32 ETHs, most participants in the Ethereum network. So Rocket Pool allows uh, for people to become a run, uh, node validator with only 16 ETH and with less technical knowledge. So that's a value proposition there. And it has two main use cases. One is um, the use case that Marcus tried, just tokenized rewards, uh, staking ETH and getting our ETH in return. And the way it works is that you put ETH in the protocol and you get our ETH in return. And automatically you start accumulating staking rewards. It's very easy for people to start doing this. You can start with 0 0.01 ETH and you can try trade our ETH back for ETH plus your rewards at any point in time. So this is fairly simple and the most attractive use cases, uh, use case, at least for me, is to become a, or to run a node in the Ethereum 2.0 ecosystem. So you will need 16 ETH plus some RPL collateral. RPL is the Rocket Pool token. And the protocol will add another 16 ETH from users' deposits from these people 
to create a validator node. And you start gaining rewards after that happens. You earn rewards on your own ETH plus the commission of these people depositing money. If you want, you can start a node with 32 ETH and start gaining rewards at the moment, but that's not really the value proposition there. So that's Rocket Pool very in a nutshell. Like this is an oversimplification of the protocol and all that does. Now let's talk about the governance. This protocol is governed by two different DAOs. We have the protocol DAO, network DAO is also how they call it. And you are going to see the nomenclature P DAO to refer to the protocol DAO. So keep that in mind. It has a mission, which is managing the settings of the protocol. Almost every setting in the protocol, every aspect is configurable. Uh, you can change the settings at any time. And the main ones are the inflation of the token, the distribution of the rewards, the bond recovery, the minimum and maximum um, um, quantities for RPO required to run a node, as well as the minimum and maximum commission fees for node operators, and the minimum and maximum um, amounts of ETH or RETH required to deposit. And the way this DAO, this sub DAO, let's call it like that, is governed is through the RPO token. So every person with RPO is able to cast votes on the decision-making processes of this protocol DAO. And then we have another DAO, which is the Oracle DAO or the O DAO for short. This is a bit tricky to explain, but I guess this is a good way to start. In Rocket Pool, you have two types of nodes. You have regular nodes, which is what we described earlier, and you have Oracle nodes. In practical sense, they are almost the same um, in regards to the technology, the node operator software that they use, and the requirements to spin up a node. But Oracle nodes have a different set of tasks. They are rewarded for those tasks. And let's explain why these oracles need to exist in order for the protocol to function at this point. Because this is staking for ETH 2.0, it requires an Oracle service. And this is why Ethereum runs on mainnet and on the beacon chain designed for Ethereum 2.0, which is where the deposits are made for Ethereum 2 staking. Those are two separate change, chains and the smart contracts on the mainnet cannot validate information by themselves about the state of the beacon chain. So you need someone to validate information from the beacon chain to the main smart contract. The ODAO does that. It's an Oracle and provides Oracle service and something that's called network liveliness. We're going to talk about it um, in a bit. It has two separate set of tasks, Oracle tasks, which are validating the balances of the mini pools. The mini pools are the, the nodes um, the Oracle DAO provides information of how much ETH and RETH are in those pools and the RPL ETH radio on the protocol itself. And it has some service tasks, mini pool validator, which is validating how many pools are in the system, not how much they own, but how many are they. If there are some withdrawals or exit positions, these people need to validate that information and communicate it to the main smart contract. And they also do something that's called protocol liveliness. It's really hard to explain, but basically means that all the levels are in sustainable numbers and the protocol is functioning as it's intended to function. And then we have to talk about who is the people composing like the Oracle DAO. The Oracle DAO spinned up um, a couple of months ago, a couple of months ago now with the launch of the protocol. And it was around 15 members for the Genesis group. Currently there are between 14 and 12 members and I'm going to explain why. And these 15 people, trusted members of the community, seasoned Ethereum stakers, so on, so on, 
report data back to the protocol. And for that data to be valid, the group must reach consensus. Those are the kind of proposals that they pass on their DAO, are basically proposals for validating data. That's the mission of the Oracle DAO. And in order to join, you need to be nominated by a member and deposit an amount of RPL. We don't know how much RPL you need to deposit. That's kind of undisclosed at this point, um, but it's supposed to be a very meaningful um, amount because it serves as a, guar a guarantee of good conduct if you're stake, quote unquote, in the protocol. And then the system members have to vote to have you inside the Oracle DAO. Um, they can still vote you to, to not include you on the Oracle DAO and you take your deposit with you. And a similar system exists for leaving the Oracle DAO. A uh, node operator, an Oracle operator can submit a proposal to leave the Oracle DAO. And in that moment, if that proposal reach consensus and gets approved, you take your initial deposit with you. So it's a very similar mechanism. And before talking about how this translates into real life, I want to open a space just to let you ask a question if you have one or to add a comment. Um, if something of this seems like a bit tricky to understand or something like that. Do you have any comments or questions at the moment? Yeah, I actually have a few questions. Uh, so how many, is there just one Oracle DAO or there is like multiple Oracle DAOs? Uh, just are, one. Okay, just just one and it's providing that kind of connection from the weekend chain to uh, the main chain, correct? Yeah. Okay. And maybe I missed that, like what's the motivation there of being, you know, uh like sync basically two uh like what's the what's are the incentives there or you might be talking about that later the motivation for having two DAOs is to not give exclusive control to the protocol DAO and also to separate the two work streams um they needed a, a body specialized in providing oracle services um so I get, I'm guessing the rationale was to not overload the work of the protocol DAO. Yeah, my my question was a little bit different. Like, what are the incentives for the Oracle DAO uh, to being uh, correct? Like, you know, like providing the right data and not manipulate the data. They get paid. Uh, they get a uh, part of the RPL um inflation schedule it's allocated for the uh, oracle DAO. so each of these nodes gets a rewarding rpl for providing these services so that's how they incentive this activity okay the and protocol they... DAO also gets uh part of the issuance of the new rpl and the rest goes to treasury and and the reward system of the protocol okay okay thank you yeah, yeah. Everybody gets paid the protocol, basically. Yeah. And all and the it, payments are done through the inflation schedule of the RPL token. Okay. Sounds good. Good to go? I'm good. Okay. Now, let's get to the weird part of Rocket Pool. You might expect some like crazy on-chain governance, you know, super automated, but surprise, it's not. It's very ad hoc. Uh, almost all the execution depends on the core team and the protocol DAO. So let's break it down. This is how a current governance, uh, you know, workflow um, looks like at the moment. So you start a discussion in a forum with a poll in, in, in the post. If there's interest, it becomes a proposal, like a formal proposal. And depending on the nature of that proposal, the protocol DAO or the Oracle DAO opens a voting session. Let me explain what I mean by this. If it's a change to the protocol, it is a matter of the protocol DAO. If the discussion is to add, remove, 
or make changes to the way the Oracle DAO functions, then the Oracle DAO is going to vote. And then most of the time, the protocol DAO executed if there's no veto or major concerns from the Oracle DAO. In terms of the execution of these proposals, because this is not automated, um, the execution relies on the protocol DAO or the core team. In theory, it's the protocol DAO who's executing everything in terms of implementing changes, setting up new technical stack on the protocol and all of that. But on practice, seems like the core team is the one, you know, um, executing the proposals. Of course, we don't have like an official statement of it, but it seems like it's the core team. So now getting to the security part, you know, how to prevent bad actors from taking over the protocol and all of that. And they had something called bootstrap mode, which was like a recovery mode for the state of the protocol. They don't have that anymore. Um, I'm not really sure why they eliminated the uh, bootstrap mode, but they gave the ODA gatekeeping um, rights for contract upgrades. So this is a safe word right here. Um, another safe word is that the Oracle DAO members that show malicious behavior can be kicked out of the organization by its system members. They also, besides kicking out uh, node operator who's acting um, in a bad way, they can burn their, their bond um, depending on the offense or depending on the behavior. And the last safe word is that basically the core team has the kill switch. They implement the changes, they control any hard uh, implementation on the code of the protocol so they can stop a malicious proposal from being implemented. Um, this is enacted through the Rocket Pool Limited Company, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, like the legal entity behind uh, the core team. And there are some risks that I identified and that also people is discussing actively in the forums. The three main ones, currently the community has no control over who joins the Oracle DAO. As I told you before, in order to be a member of the Oracle DAO, you have to be invited by its system members, and that leaves the community with no voice on the matter. So the decision of who gets into the Oracle DAO relies on the 14 or maybe 12 um, Oracle DAO active members, and I say, 12 to 14 because recently there was a security breach that affected at least 30 percent of the nodes required to reach consensus in the oracle dao um i think they were like three nodes um badly affected by this breach and those nodes were kicked out of the dao so we have in theory 12 nodes i'm putting 14 here because last time i checked um, on the on-chain metrics, it said 14, but yeah, keep it that, keep that in mind. Maybe 12 at this point. Um, so we have this as the first risk. The community has no say in who joins the Oracle DAO. Then a small breach affected 30% of the nodes required to reach consensus. That's bad but that's easily solvable by increasing the number of members of the Oracle DAO. More, more members means that you are less uh, susceptible to this kind of attacks. But there's an issue here. These people is not incentivized to add more than 15 people because then their rewards get split between more people. So they make less money from providing the same services. So yeah, that's kind of a conflict of interests there. And I'm really eager to see how they solve that. And then the last risk is that at the moment, the Oracle DAO members do not have to renew their subscription or the, um, the fact that they are part of the DAO in order to continue participating. So this leaves few options for balancing the power that those people have. And that also causes the power to stagnate between the same people across the years. So the community is actively um, looking for proposals and references of how to implement 
a rotation system or something similar for the DAO members to renew their subscription or their um, powers in, in the DAO from year to year or maybe every six months or something like that. This is an ongoing discussion on the forums right now. And then the future, as you may see, this is a very rudimentary governance system. There's little to none um, on-chain safe words. There is no um, a legitimate kill switch for um, in, impeding that bad proposals passed. And there's also a lot of involvement from the core team in the execution, which is natural for a product like this, but it needs to be more transparent. So in the future, long term and near term, there are some things that are going to change. The plan, and this is official, the plan is to dissolve and distribute the functions of the Oracle DAO. And this is going to happen, yes or yes, because once when the merge happens, there's no point on having Oracle services because everything is going to be on the same chain. I'm going to stop here. Uh, Punkar, you have a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm just like very curious about, like I haven't been on the forum, but like, like it seems to me that basically here, like if the Oracle DAO or the like protocol DAO decides like we just like take all the funds, like there are few people who just decide like we take all the funds and leave for some country <laughs> uh where we cannot be found, it basically would work. There is like there is like all the controls within hands of few. Is that correct? It's very centralized at the moment. Yeah. Okay. And is there like is it centralized because like it's it's like a company it's like legal entity and you know it's more like uh, they want to be like that maybe we're we'll talking about this now or it's like do you know what the what's the reason behind this kind of very centralized approach yeah i know the core team i know the founder and okay. they seem like good people seem like good people that's key um so their reason for um, when arguing about why it's centralized at the moment are two. One, because uh, they are fairly new to the game, um, a bit more than a year in on, on deployed on main chain, uh, I think. And two, it's because they need to secure the sustainability of the protocol before letting it go. Um, so those are the two main reasons of why the implementation of protocol changes and main proposals are centralized for now. But again, this is going to change. The Oracle DAO is going to disappear. Um, if all, all goes well, okay. um, it's going to disappear after the merge because there's not going to be any point on having um, Oracle services. They are not going to need those. And actually, and this is happening right now, they are create. They are creating a space, on snapshot for the community to create and, yeah, submit their own proposals. These proposals again are going to be executed by a centralized body, but at, uh, at least they are giving uh, the community space to articulate proposals, um, in a better way than on the forum. Um, they are still figuring out some security concerns, um, regarding uh, implementing snapshot, because their quote unquote citizens, um, I mean, the people who's going to be voting on proposals are going to be node operators. And there's a lot of concerns regarding, you know, connecting my node operator wallet to a MetaMask interface and interacting with Snapshot. So that's a huge security, security concern for the community. They are trying to create some CLI solutions for that. A CLI is command line interface um, that I'm not enough smart to explain like how that would work, but I guess they are working on it. They have a, a test proposal on snapshot going on to you know, provide that, that enough security for people to participate actively in governance. Um, this is happening right now. This is medium to long term, uh, the dissolution to, uh, for the ODAO. 
And right now, like the big end game for them is in the future, the rocket pool improvement proposals will be bought only by RPL holders. And it will take form um, of on-chain voting on something that they are calling rocket pool DAO. And that's going to be it. Like all the decision making, it's going to be converging to, a, to an on-chain DAO. And the community finally will have a saying with RPO um, token holdings. So this is going to be long-term, I'm guessing. There's still a lot of unknowns here. This is happening right now. And this is going to happen as soon as the merge comes. Maybe a couple of months later, um, they will still have to figure out how to um, distribute the functions um, of the Oracle DAO that are not uh, Oracle work, providing network liveliness um, and yeah, that kind of stuff. So that's Rocket Pool on a nutshell. And this is their ad hoc governance approach. You might be scared at this point, I will be, but they are doing pretty good. I have some data here and they have plus um, a thousand node operators. So that's a lot, almost 200K if to deposit in the protocol, 600, 6,000, sorry, uh, plus mini pools ongoing in the protocol, plus 3,000 active users. And currently, according to this dashboard on Dune Analytics, 14 Oracle DAO nodes operators so they're actually doing things the protocol is working um it's just a really nice example of how ad hoc governance can work for new protocols and i think that's that's good to see because i don't know it gives you some ideas uh, to if you are trying to spin up a product like this or a protocol like this um you can still do so without a super intricate on-chain uh, governance system from the get-go. And this is opinion, but I think this is better than designing a rigid governance system on-chain um, and then have to implement changes or maybe do a fork or something like that because just something slipped through your fingers and you didn't see it. So yeah, that's basically it. If you have comments, questions, something to say, this is going to be the moment, folks. I'm going to come back to the general view here. So, uh, Sergio, um, I was wondering, in your opinion, what's the most uh, valuable part uh, for their governance uh, structure, uh, different from uh, other DAO? Is that if that's the Oracle DAO part? Um, can you repeat the, the question? What's the most what part of the DAO? What's the most valuable uh, part of the their governance structure? The most valuable part of the governance structure is not here. I spent a couple of, of days on their Discord, and they have a group of people called rocket scientists. They are not a formal part of the Oracle DAO or the Protocol DAO. They are just people in the community with good ideas um, of what to implement for the future of the protocol. They are the ones participating actively in the forum, and they are uh, like a grassroots group inside the protocol. So they came together organically, and they are providing critical feedback appointing these risks, you know, raising their voice to, to improve the system. So allowing those spaces of participation, even though they are not officially recognized or are not officially, you know, on-chain or part of the DAO, I think it's the most crucial part. And I think th that group is the, is the one that keeps this uh, protocol functioning as it's functioning right now. So they are called rocket scientists they actually became a meme inside the organization. So that's pretty cool. And in technical terms, I guess I'm a fan of uh, dividing the power between two or maybe three DAOs. 
this is a flavor of it, not my favorite one by any means, but I think this is very valuable. Imagine having all the power in just the hands of the protocol DAO. That's a no-go for me. So that will be my answer. Thank you. Anything else? No, I if think, not, you I can voice your opinion. Like, what do you think? Do you think it's precarious? Do you think it's genius? Yeah, I, I, I think their governance is very early, uh, as far as I can say, uh, from what you described. I agree that it's sometimes easier, you know, start with very centralized approach. However, it feels to me a little bit odd that some service like they have, uh, but you know, it's uh, if people, if people, you know, believe in it, and if people trust those contributors, there is probably no issue. We will see later on if there has been an issue. I just feel like when you are capturing a lot of value uh, from the market, and uh, maybe my first question is, what's their kind of overall value, log value in the staking. Do you know So that? the overall value, like for stakers? Yes. You make more money staking with Rocket Pool than staking on your own. No, no, I mean, how, how much is locked in staking on Rocket Pool? Uh, it's actually not locked. You can withdraw at any point. So that's one main differentiator than staking on the, on the mempool, like on your own or with other service providers. Because usually, uh, if you are staking for ETH 2.0, you're going to be able to withdraw once the merge happens. In this case, it's not like that. You can withdraw and go out with your money at any point, as long as, as there's liquidity in the protocol, of course. Um, this is why having, having the communication between the Oracle DAO and the protocol, between the mempool and the mainnet, uh, for me, it's huge. That's a huge value proposition. Yeah, I, ju I just sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. I, I just wanted to say that to me is the the huge value proposition there. You can stake it and you can uh, leave it as as you like, and that's the main difference between all other staking services with ease. Yeah, but you can also sell stake it from Lido or. Yeah, actually, Lido is the biggest competitor here. Uh, at least in my eyes, Lido is winning because they have more incentive programs for their token, their, like their, their um, mirror of Ethereum. They have that in place in the broader DeFi ecosystem. I think that's something that's lacking for Rocket Pool in order to gain uh, more traction in the market and more presence. Um, but yeah. Uh, the difference with Lido is, for me, and, and again, this is going to be 100% opinion, Rocket Pool is more aligned with the decentralization ethos for me than Lido. OK. I and don't know. I guess some people will mind that when deciding like where to stake. Yeah, can you zoom in actually on the analytics part? Okay, yeah, that's what I kind of wanted to get into, like how much ETH is deposited in a Rocket Pool. So seems like pretty big amount. And, you know, personally, I trust more when this sum of the value is rather locked uh, by a smart contract and I can see like what are the rules there and like that that's got more governed like by the community. Uh, with some history, like I would be a little bit worried here, uh, honestly, with uh, what you described as who has the power kind of over it. But on the other hand, like it's probably the easiest way to do it. And also they have the all control over over the protocol. So some they mitigate some other risks there. So that's that's probably something where we will see how we will, how it will play out in the future. Yeah, I think that's important. Like people care a lot about security. 
Um, the thing with this uh, ad hoc system is that, yes, it is simpler. It is simpler than many other, you know, governance systems, um, more when we're talking about protocols. But at the same time, because it's so simple, security concerns are easy to tackle. So they detected this uh, vulnerability and they took action like almost immediately. No critical parts of the system were compromised. Only three nodes of plus 1000. Um, so that that's something, at least for me, from the, from the security, um, for proving that your security works. Um, I guess that's what you gain with centralized um, decision-making um, systems. And that's actually what they need at the moment. I think once they can, you know, assure uh, issuing schedule for their RPO token uh, that ensures sustainability in the long term, they are going to be able to let go more of the execution uh, layer of Rocket Pool and start decentralizing properly. But until that happens, I think this is the way to go for them. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. It's just uh, what what makes sense. But like, it will be really interesting to see how it evolves and how they are improving on it. And if they actually, you know, go for some on-chain governance later on, or rather keep stay off-chain. I know that even like very, uh, you know, let's say old protocols like Define 1.0 uh, are now kind of moving towards gasless governance. Uh, yeah. Because it's just, you know, too much. Yeah, there are a lot of options there. Um, right now, the priority is this. To create uh, the snapshot space and to guarantee the security for node operators to connect their, you know, their wallets to snapshot. Uh, through a safe interface. This is the priority right now. They want the community to articulate their, their ideas and their voices, and they want to create the space for that. Um, as you know, I'm involved in this uh, protocol as a meta governance delegate, and this is a big focus for them, and this is the second biggest right now. In terms of governance, of course, there are other priorities, marketing, blah, blah, blah. But in terms of governance, uh, right now it's about to give people the possibility to articulate their ideas and to vote on them uh, for the core team to execute. Yeah, that makes sense. And actually, regarding that, what is the initial distribution of the token? Do they do they have any airdrop? I know that there are some rewards, but would they have also some airdrop later on? No, they have an initial sale of the token. No airdrop. Um, the distribution, we can look at it, but I'm guessing it's going to be 70% rewards, 50% protocol DAO, and 50% Oracle DAO, last time I checked. Of course, that can change. Um, the, a protocol DAO can change the rewards distribution of rights um, if you know the community approves and all of that. OK, OK. So yep. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, Sergio. No problem, sir. I'll keep you updated with the changes in the protocol because I'm working closely with them. Uh, but so far, this is it. This is Rocket Pool. Very cool. I think I heard that, or maybe maybe I'm mistaken, that Bankless DAO has, has like put into some of the, the funds. Um, Bankless, I don't know if Bankless DAO, I know Bankless, like the, the company, the podcast, um, spin up, like, I don't know if they were like three node operators and uh, three validator nodes, something like that. Mm -hmm. They spinned uh -huh. up some nodes like a couple of weeks ago. I saw it on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sergio. No problem. It was a pleasure. OK. So is there any other questions? Or otherwise, I will stop the recording. Doesn't seem like we have more questions. So 
Thank you very much, Sergio. Uh, it was a great presentation of Rocket Pool. Uh, really excited to see how, how this will progress and maybe we can have, you know, in a few months, uh, updated presentation, like what is the new governance structure at Rocket Pool? Yeah. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Um, once they implement the snapshot um, component, it's going to be cool because I'm going to explain you um, the tricks that they are using. They are going to be using square root voting, um, which I don't know how it works because it involves math and I'm bad at math, but I'm going to study in order to explain it, I promise. So uh, do, do you mean like quadratic uh, quadratic voting? Uh, no, it's going to, I, I guess it's going to be a, a different flavor of quadratic voting um, because they were discussing between quadratic voting and something called quadratic root or quadratic something that it's not quadratic voting because I know how uh -huh. that works. Um, so it's going to be uh, their flavor of quadratic voting involving RPL holdings. Okay. And they are also going to be doing a clever implementation of uh, signing the snapshots um, voting casts from the CLI of the software that they use to run the nodes. So this is going to be um, different, not your typical snapshot implementation. So let's see how it goes. Interesting.